Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks to all of you for joining us today. I've been really looking forward to this workshop. So my name is Anita Fion, and I'm part of the Community Development and Engagement Team with RPAP. Our team members can be found across the province working with rural communities in the realm of attraction and retention of healthcare providers. I'm hosting today's workshop from West Lock, which is located in the Northeast Zone. So before we get going with today's session, I just wanna share a bit of housekeeping and information. As you've likely noticed, we have um, most of the videos off and the sound off on participants, just as an attempt to save a bit on bandwidth. We know that there's lots of people out there in rural areas who still struggle some with internet connection, and we are hopeful that this will, will be of help. So if you have any questions, please be sure to put them in the chat box and we'll do our best to watch for those and ensure that our presenter is able to answer them at the end. We will be recording the session for today and it should be available for viewing once we have an opportunity to take a look at it and ensure that the quality is suitable to share out. So today we are thrilled to be bringing um, to you this special edition of Fall Workshop Series of which we have partnered with the Alberta Rural Mental Health Network and the Tamarack Institute. Before we get going into the session today, which is on trust and relationship building with Liz Weaver from Tamarack, we have Tim Neubauer bringing greetings to us from the Alberta Mental Health Network. So over to you, Tim. Great, thanks, Anita. And good morning, everyone. My name is Tim Neubauer, and I work for the Provincial Office of the Canadian Mental Health Association. And so I'm also here today with the Rural Mental Health Network, where we are connecting community animators and action teams uh, and stakeholders across Alberta to create solutions focused practices uh, really related to rural mental health and well being. Um, so it's great to be here partnering with Tamarack and uh, RPAP in this webinar series. And so welcome everyone here today. So glad you're here. Thanks, Tim. We are so pleased to be working with you as well and your organization in offering these, these uh, workshops. So we have people joining us, I am sure, from all over Alberta today, and we are curious to know a little bit more about who is in attendance out there. So now I'll turn that over to Liz Weaver from the Tamarack Institute. Liz is the co-CEO of the Tamarack Institute, where she is leading the Tamarack Learning Centre. We are pleased to have her facilitating our session for today, and we're looking forward to learning all about trust, one of my favourite topics, that's for sure. So over to you, Liz. Great. Thanks so much, Anita. And uh, nice to see you again, Tim, and happy to work with both of you in, uh, in this workshop series. It's uh, been uh, already a couple of interesting conversations, and so we're happy to have all of you join us again today. Um, so let's, um, before we go into it too much further, just want to acknowledge that we uh, are meeting on Indigenous land and that as settlers, we're grateful for the opportunity to meet and we thank all the generations of Indigenous peoples who've taken care of this land and stewarded this land. I'm joining you from the traditional territories of the Erie Neutral, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas, um, and it, the land that I'm in is covered with the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which is a covenant between the Anishinaabek and the Haudenosaunee that was really about stewarding and caring for the lands around the Great Lakes. And the Dish is the Great Lakes, and the One Spoon is the fact that we're all nurtured by the Great Lakes. And I think it always grounds me to think about um, you know, uh, where we are and where we're uh, joining in from. We really do this at Tamarack to make the promise and the reality of our truth and reconciliation process um, real and uh, connected to our communities. Um, uh, those of you who are new to us for the first time, uh, you may not necessarily know about Tamarack, but this is a little bit about our work. So we work with 400 communities across Canada and Canada and the United States. And we work in four areas of focus, ending poverty, deepening community, building youth futures, and more recently, navigating climate transitions. And really the, uh, the intent of the vibrant communities work is to build whole of community approaches. So it's not unlike the work that you're doing in Alberta, whether it's around advancing health or 
um, addressing mental health issues. It's really about how do we create these whole of community approaches to change systems or influence systems. And then I, I at Tamarack, um, am engaged more directly in the learning center. And um, what we do at the learning center is create tools, resources, webinars, and workshops. Um, and we engage with our community partners in a whole bunch of different ways to really develop things that help you in your practice as a community change maker make uh, become more um, effective and more impactful. So that's Tamarack in a little bit of a nutshell. Um, so uh, Anita also already gave us a little bit of information about technology, but I'll, I'll cover off a few more details. Um, again, webcams, uh, happy to have you come on when we're in the conversation part, but also you may keep your webcam off if that's uh, if you're comfortable with that and also um, because of bandwidth, um, because we know we're right across Alberta and there are some rural and remote okay. communities, um, the microphones will be muted for this um, workshop um, is a hot link. Uh, and uh, um, we're uh, not going to go into breakout rooms, but you can reach out to Connor um, if you need any technical assistance. Connor is my colleague um, on this workshop at Tamrac. So we will be sending you, uh, when we send you a post webinar recording, we will be sending you a, a canvas where you can, you know, think about what you've learned uh, during the course of the, workshop, um, the course of the webinar, and then, you know, you can note some things, note some highlights for yourself. And this canvas is a great little tool to kind of get the kind of key points we're going to cover during the course of the workshop. Um, so I want to begin by asking you to share your thoughts in the chat box. I know some of you have already introduced yourselves and there's already been a, a lot of activity there. And so this will be an opportunity to go back into the chat box. But when we say the word trust, what does that word mean to you? So um, I'm gonna just quickly bring up the chat box and see if uh, folks are popping in some words. So. Uh, Andrea says that trust is a feeling of safety and security in relationship between people, something that you give to someone else. Uh, safe is another word that has been uh, brought up, telling the truth and being honest with each other, being reliable, a feeling of comfort that allows one to be oneself and express themselves, um, being open, doing what they say. It's very interesting to me as I read through, there are some similarities between um, what you're putting into the chat box, but then there are also some important nuances and some important differences. And this is true when we're bringing collaborative groups together that folks will think about, you know, how can we create trust building activities, but for some, that will mean things like psych creating psychological safety. And for others, it'll be about earning respect and earning trust and others, it'll be about being open and transparent. And so having a conversation with your you know, your collaborative team um, early on about what does trust actually mean to you? This can be a really great, it's a really great trust building activity. And it can also help to surface some of those core values that you share and how you might want to work together as a collaborative. So thanks very much, everybody, for putting your phrases in the chat box. We're going to do that a couple of times during the webinar. So um, uh, I'll signal when uh, I want you to put some more in the chat box. It's a great way of kind of learning together when we can't all be off of mute. So the goals of the workshop today of the webinar are really to understand the importance of building trust and, and how that connects to building these collaborative partnerships. Um, we're going to look at uh, navigating systems when trust has broken down and spend a bit of time on that. And all throughout, I'm going to sh show you some practical approaches, some practical tools that you could bring back to either your family or your workplace or your collaborative team 
or other collaborative tables that you might be involved in in your community. It's really quite practice focused. So hopefully you'll pick up one or two that you really like and that you'll test with some of your groups. Um, when we talk about issues like trust or power or fear, it really takes us out of our comfort zone and into our learning zone. Because when we talk about trust, it requires us to be vulnerable to some extent. We're going to say things that other people, we're not sure if other people are thinking it in the same way that I'm thinking about it, right? And so 80% of our time we spend in the learning zone and or in sorry in the comfort zone and 20% of our time we spend in the learning zone so today we're going to for this webinar we're going to be more in the learning zone so you really want to think about how can i as a person you know pull myself particularly when i'm working collaboratively into this learning zone or to support my colleagues who are sitting around a collaborative table with me into the learning zone where you need things like courage and you do things like engage in more challenging conversations and you sometimes act in the face of fear so those are all things that take us out into our learning zone so we're going to pivot now and think about trust um, more intentionally and it's really interesting i know lots of you are health professionals in the room and you probably all know this but trust and the trust um, kind of response sits at the front of our brain and distrust sits at the back of our brain. And so we have different kinds of reactions. I almost I almost kind of think to myself, when I'm feeling like I'm trusted or I'm trusting the other person, I kind of lean into that conversation and I lean in intentionally. And when I feel distrusted or I think, you know, someone is questioning my you know, authority, or they don't trust me, I kind of lean back. And so I can see myself doing that viscerally. And you've probably had that experience as well. What's interesting about trust and and you can um, observe this when folks who are brand new to a situation, walk into a room, they are thinking about five things. They're thinking about what's my status in this group, right? How important am I relative to the other people in the room? And this is um, uh, really something for us to consider, particularly when we're engaging folks with lived and living experience or citizens in the community and they perceive that there is this uh, imbalance in power in the room people are going to kind of think, okay, so what's my status? What's the certainty that I have to be able to predict the future? And I know that, you know, um, over the last number of months, the future has been pretty uncertain. And so you can see how people respond when they don't know what that certainty is all about. What's the autonomy that I have? Do I have some control over what's going to happen? And so having agendas, reviewing agendas, those kinds of things give people some of that autonomy and some of that control and asking people to step up into, you know, leading a part of the agenda also is a really nice way of, you know, creating a sense of autonomy and control relatedness. That's about that safety factor that some of you brought up in your comments about trust, right? Are the people in the room my friends or are they my foes? And so how do we create the context of relationship in everything that we do so that we're creating that relatedness and then fairness? If I say something, will people listen to me? Or if other people are saying something, am I going to give them the attention and the respect that they deserve? And so all of these things go into play when we're coming into a collaborative room or we're working on a work team or we're engaging with each other. And I think it's um, a great, a great uh, list to kind of consider and then think about, okay, how do I create, if I'm convening the group or if I'm a participant in the group, how do I create better experiences? Because when I'm convening, I wanna pay attention to this, but when I'm a participant as well, I have an equal responsibility to create, you know, that kind of certainty for others, the safe spaces and the fairness of exchanges. 
Um, when we think about trust at Tamarack, we lean quite heavily on Stephen Covey's book that he wrote a number of years ago called The Speed of Trust. And Stephen Covey uh, wrote this book in 2012, and, and some people have used the phrase that collaboration grows at the speed of trust, which I think is a lovely way of kind of considering trust. But Covey talks about these waves of trust, right? And in the waves of trust, he essentially says that we start with self-trust the degree to which we think about ourselves and have trust in ourselves to fulfill our obligation. And then it moves out into relational trust, the relationship that we have with other people. It goes to organizational trust. So, you know, do people in this room trust me and my organization or do I trust that the other people in the room and the other organizations that they represent are showing up fairly. And there's been lots of things that have happened recently where you know, our organizational trust may have diminished a little bit, um, particularly you know, in, uh, in different kinds of ways. And so we kind of want to think about that. Um, market trust is you know, if we bring folks together to, uh, to really work on you know, a collaborative issue, do the folks who are being impacted by that collaborative issue, do they believe that they're going to be better off as a result of that collaborative work? So that's a little bit of market trust. And then societal trust is like the society believe that you can do it. Does your community believe, you know, and to what degree are we paying attention to all of these waves of trust as we, you know, create these spaces for people to engage with one another authentically and create trust building environments. Covey goes on to say, and here's where we're going to um, ask you to put some additional thoughts into the chat box, but Covey says, in terms of self-trust and relational trust, here are 13 things that we could do, 13 behaviors that we could build in uh, to our own kind of behavioral toolbox around you know, really creating uh, a good self-trust, but also creating that good relational trust. And he says, you know, it's about talking straight. It's about demonstrating respect. It's about listening authentically or listening first. It's about clarifying expectations. Now, Covey wrote this in 2012, and we're now in 2021. What might you add to this list? Because, you know, I think the list is a good starting point, but but isn't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily always cover our current context. Because one of the things that we know is that equity is um, a really emergent factor in our current context. So how would we build trust using an equity lens? What are some other things? And I can see that you're already putting things in um, to here. How do we engage in reflective listening? Uh, how do we pay attention to body movement? That's really interesting. Uh, how do we build patience into this? Facial expressions, maintaining confidentiality. Yeah, those are all really good. Saving space and listening. You know, that's a really difficult one for me, particularly when we're doing remote workshops. And I'll uh, open it up to the group and I'll say, uh, who wants to weigh in with their advice? And sometimes you get crickets, right? And so it's for me, the challenge is how, how long do I leave that silence so that someone goes into the space of silence? And I think a lot of us aren't very good at that. So how do we create that space and say, okay, we're going to give you time to reflect first. Um, and you can create that space by giving people time to reflect first and then inviting the conversation in. Um, uh, that's a really great strategy for that. Amplifying the voice of voices of the experts and the experience from marginalized participants. Uh, being open builds trust too. So thank you all for that. Those are really great suggestions. And I, I think you can see um, by those suggestions that this is a good starting list. But in the context that we're working, we always have to kind of consider what would we add now, particularly because of, you know, we all have these different kinds of contexts that we exist in. 
Covey goes on to say that relationship building is that second wave of trust. And he talks about relationship building in four different ways. So sincerity, reliability, competence, and care. And I think most of us would agree on sincerity, reliability, and care. But what struck me is this notion of competence. When someone volunteers to do something around your collaborative table, do they have the competence to take that task on? And how do we support them if they don't? Do they have the skills, the capacity, the knowledge and or the resources to be able to do that uh, effectively? And I would add in here, do they have the time? You know, particularly if it's someone who has a really full schedule. And so then how do we support that kind of building relationship in an authentic way and really understanding, you know, um, how the collaborative can move forward. So again, Covey gives us lots of great advice here. Building trust in a, a virtual environment is slightly different, but I think there's lots of lessons that we can learn here that we can bring to our, our work environments or, you know, our collaborative environments. And so um, they, in a virtual environment, they say, you know, at the very beginning, there's this uh, bond of trust that is created, often referred to as swift trust. So you need to build on that swift trust, right? And you need to create things that really say, hey, we've got your trust. Now we're going to do things like send out minutes from the meeting, or we're going to follow up on some of the actions that we agreed to. So that's taking that swift trust and taking it to the next level. There's also encouraging interpersonal trust, which is creating those spaces where people can have that relational capacity and lean into the relational capacity, communicating with predictability. So you know, don't wait to the day before the next meeting to send out the minutes. You want to have a predictable kind of way that you communicate with folks that are particularly around collaborative tables or around work teams. And when we're more remote, communicating with predictability is even more important. And then thinking about how could we share and rotate power. So there's some interesting nuances when we're um, building trust virtually. Um, so now we're going to pivot slightly and give you some tools. We've already given you a couple, but we're going to put some more tools in your toolbox. The first thing is kind of understanding why trust is important for collaborative teams. And these are all uh, pretty evident, self-evident. But what I like about this list is that, you know, when you have built trust in uh, your collaborative team and something changes, you can adjust for that growth or you can adjust for that change. Um, so that's a really, I think, helpful thing to kind of consider um, in your team environment. Um, one great tool that we use a lot at Temrec and that we love, and you can do it both virtually or you could do it um, in when you're having face-to-face -face meetings again, is that you ask people it's this called the personal asset inventory. You ask people to uh, fill in different post-it notes. You might give them uh, pink post-it notes for passion and blue post-it notes for skill. And you ask people to say, okay, we're working together collaboratively. Write things that you are passionate about that might help the collaborative advance and write some skills that you have that could be really helpful for this collaborative work to advance. And, each person does that on their own. Then you come together as a group and you start to group them together and you look at what patterns are um, emerging. And then you kind of have this conversation about, oh, okay, so look, I see that lots of us are really passionate about families or, you know, um, Holly is really passionate about photography. You know, can we as a group, can we um, benefit from those passions or their skills? How can we benefit? And so it's a really nice way of learning more about each other, but also creating the opportunity for conversation and for connection between folks. Another way of building trust is to kind of build these four elements into your um, agenda. And so one element is connecting. 
one element is aligning, another element is learning, and the final element is making. And if we switch the four around a little bit, it would stand for the acronym COM. Uh, so what are we doing to connect to one another? How are we creating those opportunities to remind all of us about our shared and collaborative work and where we are in our work plan or in our in achieving our mission? What are we learning together? And then what decisions are we making? Or what, you know, what are we thinking about in terms of next steps or practical action? So again, a great little tool. And when you put your agendas together, you can, you can actually put calm on the side and you can say, okay, so, hey, what are we gonna do to make connections? What are we gonna do to align around the work? the shared purpose of the shared work. It's a great way of forming agendas. The other um, really great tool is to really think about the types of questions that you're asking and how you're engaging folks around your collaborative tables. And so there is something to consider in terms of less powerful questions and more powerful questions. So less powerful are questions that start with did, can, will, which, and sometimes there are questions that limit you to a yes or no kind of answer, right? They're often referred to as closed questions, more open questions or more powerful, powerful questions, it's hard to say, are things like when, where, and who, or what, how, and why. Those are the kinds of questions that, and the kinds of framings that uh, you might want to use, or the most powerful are things like who else, or what if, or what would it take? Though That kind of framing is really critical in terms of trust building. So when you're thinking about, okay, I'm gonna bring an idea out to the group and I, I uh, I want their feedback around this idea. Really consider how you're setting up the question and what the question looks like. Some additional things that you can put in your toolbox are things like checking in and checking out at the beginning and ending of uh, conversations. Why is it important that I'm here today? As one of those um, more powerful questions, what will it take to get to the change that we envision together or that we want? Um, what can I give to this collaborative? What do I need to get out of this collaborative? And what are the constraints I'm working on? And again, we invite you to put other um, uh, questions or approaches that you use into the chat box. And we'll highlight some of those as we get to the end of the workshop. Now we're gonna pivot slightly to the, the thing that we don't often talk about, which is turf, right? And turf, you know, um, appears in many different ways in um, the work that we do. And it's really the shadow side of trust, right? When, when we're feeling in our um, gut that things might not be going as well as they could, it's probably some type of a turf issue or some type of, some type of a broken trust issue. And so turf is that kind of space between us, right? That the difference between working together and working in isolation. And sometimes turf is a way that we protect ourselves or others protect themselves in the group. And we um, at Tamarack often use this example. So what are behaviors? How does turf show up in different kinds of behaviors? And sometimes there are fight behaviors. Sometimes there are flight behaviors, but what we really want to get to is to identify what are the working behaviors that are really going to help us optimize our group and decrease some of the levels of turf. And so fight behaviors in this case of giving information, um, opinions and suggestions, sometimes it's like people make these big long speeches or they take a fixed position and they're unwilling to move from that fixed position. Those are fight behaviors. And you can almost see how some of those are more aggressive kind of behaviors. Some flight behaviors, that's a person kind of moving themselves away from the conversation or diverting attention from the conversation. They can take side trips or sometimes you might be in a group where you know, the group is engaged in a really good conversation, but two people are having a sidebar conversation. And that's a little bit of a flight behavior, right? They're not fully engaging. 
And so really what we want to do is to think about, okay, how can we work together? Do we need to set some group norms? Do we need to uh, identify some of the underlying issues? Perhaps they don't want to talk about the, the, um, the thing that your group is talking about because they have a bit of fear around that or a bit of reticence around that. So try to identify those. Here's another example of fight, flight, and work. And this is, again, responding to differences in perspectives and values. This goes one more layer down. So fight behaviors are only focusing on the differences. And you can hear that show up in some cases where, oh, we're never going to agree, or we agree to disagree, right? And then that shuts down the conversation. Um, Others might be stereotyping or labeling others. Some of those flight behaviors that show up sometimes are, you know, the parking lot conversations, that secrecy to avoid confrontation, or other people saying, well, you know, I'm just going to go along with the flow. I'm not going to actually bring in another opinion because it's clear that it seems like someone is dominating this conversation and they don't want to raise any ire. Really what we want to again do is work towards working behaviors, right? Uh, this could be where we clarify the differences or we identify them. We might use data to deepen our understanding of that. So particularly when we're dealing with, you know, um, issues that are more complex in our communities. So in the slide deck and also what you'll get in the, um, uh, the canvas that I showed you at the beginning is an exercise that you can do on your own or you can do with your group and you can put whatever you want uh, in the middle. I've put dealing with turf issues here, but think about, you know, what are fight behaviors that you've observed? What are some flight behaviors that you've observed? And then how would we work more effectively together? So uh, think about this as a great little tool to kind of do with your group um, or even do on your own if you have a particular um, set of behaviors that you're experiencing around your collaborative table and you'd like to kind of figure out strategies to really deal with those. So here are some strategies around turf, some things that we can pull into our uh, turf toolbox. Um, one is to focus on the larger goal. Uh, as I said, do research about what, um, what is the background around that issue and then how you might approach it. Um, problem solve with a small group of people or with the big group if you feel comfortable. Figure out a process to negotiate if you have to. Really control your own emotions. And that's hard in the moment, but you might say something like, um, you know, I see that this is a challenging issue for our group to deal with right now. Let's take a break. And let's come back at it at our next meeting, or let's take a 10 minute break. Um, everybody go and write down something, think about what we were just talking about. Again, give people that space and time and that kind of self reflection and then come back to it. And then, you know, the final thing is um, decide if it's worth it. And uh, my colleague, Adam Kahane, who's written a number of books, he's written a book about collaborating with the enemy. And he has four strategies for collaborating with the enemy. And one of the strategies is if it's not working, you got to know when to walk away. It goes back to that old Kenny Rogers song, I think, right? Uh, know when to hold them and know when to fold them. Um, uh, but I digress. Uh, there are some principles to remember on this slide. I think it is helpful to have some strategies in your toolbox, particularly when you're dealing with turf. So we know that trust does break down in groups, um, and these are ways that trust breaks down. Um, not fulfilling your commitments, others not fulfilling their commitments. Sometimes we get into the blame game, and sometimes it's all down to our inability as the convener of the group to effectively or constructively confront issues. Uh, we just back away um, because we feel some of that threat ourselves. And so we would say, you know, observe what's happening and then consider, you know, how you might deal with that using some of the strategies on the previous slide. 
or we also have a eight part um, approach that you could consider. And this is the eight part approach. Uh, and this can happen both for uh, in your kind of one on one relationships, but it can also happen, you know, in a larger group relationship. So um, it might be that you start and you discuss what happened, right? Uh, you want to clarify the facts. Well, I, when you did this, I felt this. So it's not about blame. It's about clarifying your what happened and what your reaction was to that and also what the reaction was of the individual that um, you're trying to rebuild trust with. Um, make and accept sincere apologies. That's really a critical part of this. And then you could explain the reason or you could invite the other person to explain the reason for the betrayal. Normally what happens is we do these first four really well. And for some cases where trust has broken down, that's all you really need to do. But if it's a big breakdown, if it's um, something where someone has let you down quite significantly, you might want to do the second set of four steps, right? Which is to create a plan between yourself and this other person around or this other group around rebuilding the trust. You want to stick to the plan over time, say, okay, for the next six months, we're going to work in this way in an attempt to rebuild our trust. And we're going to check in on a monthly basis, right? So we're going to stick to this plan and see how it's going for you and see how it's going for me and think about how we might adjust the plan. You want to assess your progress as you're going. How are we doing to all uh, in terms of rebuilding trust? Where are some of the bumps that we might have encountered in the road? And then you want to um, really be patient um, and, you know, check in with the person and also make sure that it's working for them because we have a relationship in trust, right? We have this, you know, if you think about Stephen Covey, we're going right back to the very beginning of all of this. We have this self-trust is the place that we start. That happens with both people, and it's then the two people and the relation trust. So um, we have a role to play in repairing trust when it breaks down as well. So uh, the final thing that I'm going to ask you to do, hopefully you're sitting at your desk or near a piece of paper. What I'd love you to do is to uh, think for two minutes two or three ideas that uh, struck you during the course of this uh, webinar. What are two or three ideas that are, are things that you'd wanna think about a little bit further and then pick one of those ideas and that will be the thing that you work on. So before we open it up to questions and comments, we'll get you to do that. And we'll give you two minutes for that. When you're ready, pop into the chat box uh, either a question that you might have or a reflection that you'd like to share with one another. And I'll bring those forward. And we already have a couple of them here. Uh, um, Jackie, I just want to acknowledge I do speak fast, but you will get the full PowerPoint and the resources and Holly uh, let you know that um, we're also going to send out a recording to everybody so you can listen to it again. I apologize for uh, speaking fast around that. I, I do do that sometimes. Um, uh, uh, Crystal says, uh, not sharing information as a collective is very difficult. Yeah, that you're absolutely right about that, Crystal. I think that's where, you know, if you think about that um, slide that I showed on Swift, Swift Trust, it's that what do we agree to in terms of regular communications and regular check-ins, right? How are we going to be able to do that in a way that, you know, make sure that everybody as a collective um, is getting the same pieces of information and is invited to um, participate in the same kinds of ways. And, you know, there's more and more technology that is a lot uh, enabling us to do that. I know um, at Tamarack, 
we use Microsoft Teams. And so we set up little Teams channels that, you know, we can bring people in and then everything gets posted into that channel. That may not be something that you have in your workplace or with your collaborative group. And so you want to think about, you know, is it every Monday that on a regular basis we send something out to the collaborative? It can be really short. Um, but at least we have the kind of regular communications that is going on. And it could be your Monday morning update or your Monday morning smile. And you could have like a fun thing in it and, you know, then some updates. Um, so think about that kind of regular communication. And once you get in a pattern of that regular communication across the whole collaborative, then the whole collaborative um, will uh, begin to think about you know what are their contributions to this as well. Andrea says that a big thought is that trust starts with yourself first, trusting others to know uh, when to and when not to extend trust to others. Uh, that was a big aha moment for uh, Andrea. Um, Carol and I agree we have two, uh, two ears and one mouth, right? And what's the time What's the balance of time that we spend in either? Uh, and I think, you know, sometimes we, we listen, but how many of us, while we're listening, are already thinking about the next thing, right? As opposed to really actively listening. And that might be one of those commitments that you make to each other is that we're gonna spend this next half hour really intently listening to one another and not trying to problem solve. Another really great uh, tool that I use a lot is that rather than jumping to solutions, I will spend, you know, with a group, um, maybe 10 minutes saying, what are the questions that we have about this, right? So for example, around building trust, what would be questions that you have about effective ways to build trust? And some of you might say, well, what do you mean by effective ways? And others, a other person might say, well, what do we mean by trust? And so when you just spend time only in the question part of it before you jump to solutions, what happens is by surfacing questions, you start to see what people are interested in talking about, and then you can more effectively um, talk about, you know, the it. And then you can more effectively also jump to some, you know, ways of solving the it. Uh, uh, Crystal says that some people are toxic uh, and who may hold a position where you are in need of building trust. Sometimes the person does need to go. Well, that's what Adam Kahane would say, you know, that there are times where you have done your best to create a very positive situation. And uh, there are times where, you know, either you have to walk away or you have to create, you know, an opportunity for them to walk away. I, I have this um, PowerPoint and I'll share it with, uh, with Holly, Tim and Anita called um, Creating Successful Beginnings and Endings. And we're really good at creating good beginnings, but we're not really good at creating successful endings. And endings can be, you know, helping people to move away from your table, but it can also be about wrapping up the work of the table, right? And how do we do that successfully? I think sometimes we just go, okay, this is our last meeting. You go through your regular agenda and everybody else goes away, right? Without really thinking about, you know, what, are we, what have we learned from being together? What are some reflections that we have if we were to, you know, gather together again a year from now, what would our expectations be around that? So a really successful ending also creates that opportunity for learning. Remember that calm, it creates that opportunity for connection, for learning, and even for leaning in a bit to making and making some choices about how to form your collaborative going forward. Um, uh, the, Michaela talks about um, not letting your trust be taken away. Yeah, yeah. So that's a really interesting uh, perspective that you're bringing forward, Michaela, is that, you know, how do we invest in our own trust and how do we not let it um, be taken away from us? And what are what are our commitments to, you know, that self-trust, right? How are we building our competencies? How are we not over committing ourselves 
so that we can say, hey, it's reasonable that I can contribute this, but I can't over contribute this. Or when do I ask for help? When is it that I actually need to say, hey, I'm over committed. Uh, normally, I would have put my hand up first, but like in the next three weeks, I just can't take on anything more. And that's one of those gives, gets, and constraints conversations, right? Because we all work in different times and different rhythms. And you know that when you're working across community, community pressures change all the time. Um, if you work in the educational sector, for example, there are times where, you know, you're uh, marking exams or times where you're prepping for a new year. And those are times that you wouldn't necessarily approach someone in the education sector, but every sector has these rhythms. And so how do we understand what those rhythms are and how do we also um, protect those rhythms for ourselves? Um, I think that's a really, really good point that you make, Michaela. Uh, Holly talks about focusing on the larger goal and controlling emotions resonated with her. And I think that that's, uh, yeah, controlling emotions. Uh, uh, I think that's a really hard one, right? Luckily, we're more remote now. I know that sometimes, uh, you know, you can just have that minute of blowing off steam and the only person that hears that is your dog. <laughs> And then you kind of breathe a little bit and focus back in. So that's where a remote environment actually is a little bit more helpful than face-to-face uh, -face and in-person environment. They don't necessarily see you blowing off steam, but uh, I do think we do have to think about, you know, uh, and then think about not only the controlling of the emotions, but why am I reacting in this way? I think is a really good question to add there. You know, what is it about this? Am I feeling stressed? Am I feeling under pressure? Uh, what is it um, about what I read in this email? Someone wrote earlier, you know, um, about texting and making sure that, you know, when we're texting someone that the message gets across well. I think the good thing about remote is that we can blow off steam. The bad thing about remote is sometimes we don't uh, really get the sentiment of the message. And so maybe it's up to us then to say, hey, you know, I got your email or I got your text message. I'm not sure we're on the same page here, right? And to then get some of that clarity around that. So I think those are really uh, important perspectives, Holly, and thanks for uh, bringing that forward. Um, changing, Joy talks about changing the way that um, they ask powerful questions. I agree, agree 100% with you, Joy. I think it is um, so critical that we ask questions that are open and inviting questions and that are in many ways not judgmental, right? That really says, what could we do together? What's the possibility? What if we dreamed bigger? What if, you know, those kinds of things are the kinds of questions that I really like. Um, Rosemary talks about allowing people to think and respond into silence. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's one I work on all the time. And also I'm learning more and more as I practice this that I just have to leave the silence happen, right? And, and leave it, it, sometimes it's a minute, sometimes it might be a little bit longer, but then someone will jump in. And I think what people are doing is they're they're processing, but they're also, you know, um, feeling they need to feel the safety of jumping in with their idea as well. If, if it's more difficult for you, having people write first, write their thoughts down first, and then jump in with their thoughts, you've at least given them uh, opportunity to uh, consider the question reflect on it themselves, capture a couple of their notes, and then it's easier to then jump into the, you know, uh, let's uh, share with one another um, uh, what we consider. Jennifer asks, uh, can technology impact our ability to work through these stages? Um, how do we build trust with our limited ability to uh, be together? It's interesting. We just held a conference at Tamarack called The Great Reconnect, and there is something about human connection and face-to-face -face connection, right? And, 
And so there are real benefits to technology um, and to virtual learning experiences because people can come from around the globe. That's what we've seen at Tamarack. We have people joining us all the time in our workshops from Australia, New Zealand, the UK, Italy, um, uh, Africa. So we to, so a virtual learning experience can bring lots of people from different parts of the world. And what they bring when they're coming from different parts of the world are different kinds of experiences that inform the growth of our own knowledge. Because, you know, um, how they do something in New Zealand is different than how we might uh, approach it in Canada, for example. So that's the benefit. The challenge is that you can also shut off, right? So, and, and we see this when we put folks into Zoom groups, for example, for some, uh, some smaller group conversations. If someone has stepped away from their computer and you put them into a Zoom group, then you have to wait for them to come back and they join the Zoom group later. So, it, so there are benefits to virtual learning, there are or virtual engagement, and then there are challenges. In some cases and in some parts of the places that you serve, um, across northern Alberta, for example, it might be that virtual a virtual option enables far more people to participate. So it can be a really positive option, but then you've got to be really thoughtful about how do we engage in conversations? What are the types of questions? Can we do a connection exercise of one sort or another? So all of those things you have to be way more thoughtful about. I'm doing just I'll give you one of the tips I use a lot. Um, I'm doing some work with a group in Indiana. I have never met them in person, but every time we get together and we get together every couple of weeks, I put up a slide that has all of their pictures on that slide, right? And uh, I know that we're all kind of on video at the same time, but even having all of their pictures on the slide, and I call it the design team. And as we do a check-in conversation, everybody is seeing everybody else on one slide. And it's just a nice way of creating that kind of connection because they're all almost around the same group. And you could, you know, if you had the technology, I'm not as good at technology as I could be, but you could have them all sitting around the table, right? So you could create this kind of virtual uh, connection with them. So, you know, you can do fun things like that, that makes it um, more real for folks. Um, uh, Shelly talks about incorporating more powerful questions uh, from the art of powerful questions, which means uh, more than active listening to be able to do so. So I uh, absolutely agree with you, um, Shelly. Rita Ann um, talks about getting a good night's sleep and taking care of your mental health. Absolutely. I think you're right about that, uh, Rita Ann. And I think it's something that, you know, we don't maybe do enough of during these uh, these times, we really do need to build in rest and exercise and healthy food and taking breaks from our computer, even if it is to let out the dog, but, you know, take those pauses, because I think there are less times than that you'll, uh, you know, have that where you have to let off uh, steam, because in fact, what you've done is you've done that self care, which is I think a really important part of this, um, starting each day with gratitude and taking the time to breathe before responding. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. There's um there's this really cool thing that someone just let me know about uh that I I'm going to uh buy for my team and for other people this year. It's a one uh uh gratitude in one line and it's a 5-year calendar. And so our five year book and every day you put in one line of gratitude that you have for that day. And then you just keep entering in over a five year period. And then you have that to kind of reflect on, you know, what are the trends that have happened for you over the last five years? And I just think it's such a lovely way of thinking about you know, what's happening to us in our lives and by capturing one line and, and they're actually, I was looking them up on uh, Amazon and they're not very expensive. So I, I thought, oh, what a lovely gift to give people to really have them not only reflect about gratitude, but then also look at the trends of gratitude um, over a longer period of time. 
Uh, Alicia says, you know, the trouble with texts and emails is that you have no idea you're on the receiving end um, what the person, uh, when the person will get be getting the information. You're absolutely right. And so I think it's kind of like, how do we, how do we be more gentle with our emails or how do we, you know, um, put some timelines on it, but give people enough time to respond effectively those kinds of things. When you're in person, you have the luxury of adjusting your tone. You're absolutely right. And, you know, how often now in these days do we actually call people up? Um, uh, you know, those of you who have Microsoft 365, um, there's this new thing called the Viva in Microsoft Office 365, where you can, um, you can have the program uh, remind you to think about gratitude, to do some of that self-reflection and self-care. They, they've partnered with um, uh, an initiative where you can play music in the background and take a five minute meditation. And also they have an opportunity for you to connect with your colleagues or to send some praise to them. Um, you don't have to do it every day. You can do it at your leisure. But I find for my life, because it's really busy, those um, intentional prompts are very helpful to me. Um, and so I do, I do use them to, you know, create a little bit more balance in the work that I do. And so whatever works for you, right? Um, or even thinking about, you know, when is it that I actually really, I texted and emailed this person a lot, when do I need to call them up or set up a time for a face-to-face -face meeting, socially distanced, of course, and all those kinds of things. Uh, have a break in evening session so people can take the time to say good night yet to their kids. That's a lovely idea, Deborah. I love that idea if you're having evening sessions. Hey, so I see that we are at the end of our time. Anita, do you have anything that you want to um, say to wrap up? Sure, I can do that, Liz. Thank you. So, And thank you so much for this wonderful session on building trust within our relationships for stronger collaboration and connections. It sounds to me like time spent building trust would make working and living a whole lot easier. <laughs> And also thanks to everyone for all the engagement via the chat box. I found it really great to read those comments and to have Liz facilitate the learning from those uh, comments as well. So thank you to all of you for that. And just to mark your calendars for a few other learning opportunities coming your way. Um, so we're doing our third workshop with the Tamarack Institute and it is on new ways of engaging with our rural communities. And that'll be on November 25th. And on November 10th, we will be hosting Communities Choose Well to share more about their resources and various opportunities. I think that Holly, uh, November 10th is Choose Well. Did I give you the wrong date on that? Anyways, November 10th is the Choose Well. November 25th is the other Tamarack workshop. And we invite you to check out our events page that Holly will pop in the chat box for more details on those sessions and to be able to directly register there. Um, and once again, just thanks to you, Liz, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. It was a pleasure to host everyone, and we hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. See you soon. Mm -hmm.